Emilio Artaccio for the session, the first session. And it is a session on utilizing data in computational materials discovery. And uh, it is uh, something that nowadays is being described with the catchphrase uh, big data. And uh, I have put on the board a couple of examples of big data. So two big pieces of information. <coughs> so in that catchphrase, it's uh, for those of you that don't know much about big data, but know a little bit of Latin, that comes from, uh, it's the plural of datum, which is a given, so a piece of information. So we are not going to be talking about big data as this, we're going to be talking about big data sets. <coughs> so, uh, this is something that, as ever, in uh, science, technological advances motivated by other things have uh, given up op new opportunities. In this case, uh, as you probably know, there are big warehouses being built in the desert of Nevada, storing uh, lots of computers, lots of computers and storage capacity. And uh, there, you can do the numbers yourselves. Uh, imagine that uh, of the order of a few billion people, half of the order of several and quite a few gigabytes of storage. So that is an enormous technological change that has happened during the, during the last uh, years. I don't know how many decades you can do the, during the last decade, probably. Most of it, of course, is photographs of cute babies by very proud parents or grandparents. But uh, the technology itself is what we're taking care of here. And also, within the effort that is being developed in those uh, warehouses, what you have is lots of information about whatever we're doing, each, of, each one of us, every day. And uh, there is extracting of information from that, learning useful things, some of them not so useful, but uh, useful things, trying to extract things from that amount of data. So that has brought about a branch of science of the manipulation of large data sets, which is a brand new branch of science, which is called statistics. And <coughs> I really liked very much the quote of Gabor uh, yesterday about computational statistics. So we do have statistics, and we, we do have an enormous amount of computer power, and computer power in the sense of high throughput would be the one related to, to that kind of effort and uh, quite a lot of managing of information. So then we have to learn how to learn from that information. <clears throat> and so, uh, but the other thing we can do is of course use that kind of technology to store our kind of information. So the kind of simulations we have been doing for decades is a kind of simulation in which we normally stored very large files into disks that used to be called scratch because we would store a lot of information, extract what we needed for our particular science at that particular moment, and then erase most of it. So the idea came about that with these new uh, opportunities of technology, we could store quite a lot of information and we produce a lot. If you just think about the coefficients of wave functions in, for a large system in a molecular dynamic simulation with a long time scale, just immediately you have a huge amount of information. So the idea of storing systematically uh, uh, quite a lot of that information is uh, allow us to think that one could extract much more than the information, than the science that was extracted originally when it was first calculated for a particular purpose. So you can repurpose that kind of information. <clears throat> so, but that of course brings challenges that relate to how to extract things from there, how to learn. So in one part, so we saw a couple of already very interesting talks by Gabor and Gabor Xanyi and uh, uh, Michele Ceriotti yesterday uh, about uh, how we learn 
from data. But we also have to, to face the challenges of the data uh, themselves, uh, of the data itself. And uh, today we're going to see a, a first talk in which uh, we will be essentially facing how uh, do you <coughs> describe some of the properties of how do you characterize things in that data. Going back to my very useful example at the very beginning, I was talking about photographs of cute babies. So how do you characterize cuteness of the babies? You just have uh, enormous amounts of bitmaps. So you have to extract from there something which is not trivially extractable. So you have to be able to describe what you want, descriptors. And so that is going to be the first talk. And, and then, uh, in everything I've said so far, everything was about quantity. But whenever we're facing and working with something, we have the double side of quantity and quality. And that will be the second talk of today's session. So without uh, more information, and after my brilliant presentation of big data, <coughs> let me introduce the first speaker today. Um, so Shobana Simhan, she's going to tell us about descriptors from small data. Simple yet successful descriptors for self-assembly of organic molecules on surfaces. Good morning. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I've called it descriptors from small data because usually nowadays when you hear about descriptors, it's from big data. My descriptors are from very small data indeed. Uh, you will see how small. Uh, my collaborators are my students, Sukanya Ghosh. Uh, the experiments were done by George Thomas at Isaac Trivandrum and his PhD student, Pratap. So let me introduce. Uh, I guess you all know that one of the hardest problems in our field is that of structure prediction. So for example, if you had two atoms, a yellow atom and a purple atom, suppose they add up to an octet in valency. If you want to know whether they would form the rock salt structure or the zinc blend structure or the wurtzite structure, it's very hard to predict. I mean, of course, we can do a DFT calculation and say which would be lowest in stretch in energy, but can we say, just looking at the atoms alone, can we see a pattern in the which structures are lowest in energy? And the answer is, of course, no, it's very hard to see a pattern in that. I'll get back to that problem later in this talk, but what I want to talk about is the analogous problem for self-assembly so if I'm given two molecules, this yellow molecule and this violet molecule, I want to know, can I say something looking at the individual molecules alone about the geometry of the self-assembled architecture that they will form? So obviously one is interested in the geometry of the self-assembled architecture. For example, here there are two pictures. In this one, the molecules have self-assembled so that they're cavities, whereas in this one, they're self-assembled so that they're tightly packed. And you would like to know which of these two it would form, because here, in these cavities, you can put in other molecules. Here, you can't. So this is an interesting question for applications. And I want to for, find descriptors for this. I think most of you know what descriptors are, but I'll say a little bit about it anyways. There's some combination of physical properties of the system that correlate well with the property of interest, but the important thing about them is that they should be very quick to compute. They should be faster to compute than either doing the ab initio calculation or doing the experiment. They may not be as accurate as either of those, but they generally help you narrow down the space in which you're looking for candidate materials. And so they help you uh, save a lot of time compared to doing the experiment or doing the DFT calculation. And how do you develop them? 
Well, initially, people were just developing them with physical intuition, and nowadays, increasingly, people are dis developing them using uh, machine learning techniques, for example. Uh, I asked my students for an example of a descriptor to give here, and one of my students showed me this paper, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is, of course, a very prestigious journal. And this shows that you have a correlation between two rather unexpected things, which is the number of Nobel laureates per, per capita in a population of a country and the chocolate consumption in that country. And you see you have a rather good uh, correlation between the two. Now, I, I show this for a reason, which is when you have descriptors, you often find rather unexpected correlations. Okay, you see correlations between things that you really wonder why the hell are those two things correlated. And um, now you want to understand it. Now in this paper, which I actually went and read, the authors say that chocolates contain compounds called flavonoids and flavonoids uh, affect your intellectual capacity, they affect your brain and your neuro neurology and that's why these two are correlated. Of course, you can think of other explanations. For example, if a country is wealthy, then it can spend money on science and it can also spend money on chocolate. Okay, so uh, the systems and the methods. Uh, it's, this is my data set and that's why I call it small data because it's really a very small data set. So I have three host molecules which I have chosen to represent as these bone shapes. So they have a backbone, they have phenylene ethylenes, they have these backbones, they have COOH groups at the termini, and then they have these alkoxy side chains. Now the three of them differ in important ways. These two have the same length of the backbone, this one has a shorter backbone. These two have COOH groups at both ends, this one has it at only one end. These two have four alkoxy side chains. This one has only two alkoxy side chains. This is important. These are important differences between them. And then the guest molecules are naphthalene, phenanthrene, etc. And the important thing for them is I can see, I can look upon them as angular fragments of coronine. Okay, so this is a geometrical view of looking at them, which I think is useful. So let's look at the host molecules first. And the host molecules self-assemble into architectures by forming hydrogen bonds between the COH groups at the termini. And they can form in two kinds of patterns. We know this from experiment. They can be either linear or they can be hexagonal. Uh, let me show you that again. So this is an atomistic picture, the red lines show how the hydrogen bonds are arranged. I'll show you that again. So this is one molecule, then the next molecule, then the next molecule, and that's called the linear pattern. And this is one molecule, and the next molecule, and the next molecule, and that's the hexagonal pattern. And in both these patterns, there are cavities inside which the guest molecules can fit. So the question, first that I'm asking is can I predict the relative energetics of the two patterns by looking in some way at just the isolated host molecule? Okay, so that's the fundamental question I want to ask. So how do we do it? This is a standard methodology when you're finding descriptors, except that it's usually done on much larger data sets. You have some experiments to guide you, you perform DFT calculations, you assemble a DFT database, then you do some analysis, and this analysis is some combination of intuition and you do regression instead of machine learning because it's such a small set. You develop descriptors, and then to check if your descriptors are accurate, you predict something and you verify it. And these are my calculations. The DFT calculations are pretty standard. They were done with Siesta, and the experiments were done with scanning tunneling microscopy. Now, I, using the DFT database, I calculate uh, free energies for the hex patterns and the Lin patterns. I need chemical potentials because the ratio of 
of uh, host to guest molecules is different in the two patterns. Uh, so let me show you some results. Um, sorry. So the important thing is uh, because of these subtle differences in the three host molecules, the length of the chain, the number of head groups they have, et cetera, they form different patterns when they're deposited on graphene. So the first molecule forms the hex pattern. This is the experimental STM image. This is a simulated STM image. The third molecule forms the lin pattern, the linear pattern. And the second molecule doesn't form an ordered pattern at all. It forms what's a glass, glassy pattern. And then when I introduce the guest molecules, for example, when I introduce coronine, in some cases, the pattern remains basically unaltered. So this is in the absence of the guest. And then when I introduce coronine, you can see coronine just goes and sits in these cavities. So you have these blobs here. Whereas in other cases, the pattern changes drastically on introducing the guest. So this is PE4B. It forms the linear pattern in the absence of the guest. And then when I introduce the guest, you can see the symmetries change drastically, and it goes from a linear pattern to a hexagonal pattern. So to summarize what happens, I have, when I have just the host molecules, one forms the hex, one forms the glass, and one forms the lin. I can do DFT calculations to check the difference in free energies between the two. And a negative number means the hex is favored. A positive number form means that the lin is favored. And indeed, that's what DFT gives you. And if the difference between the two is small, what happens is that there's a competition between the two phases. And that's why it forms a glassy phase. Uh, and here is what happens when you introduce the guests. For this molecule, it stays in hex. For this one, initially, it is glass, glass, and then you have a disorder to order transition, and it becomes a hex. For this one, it's linear, 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 and then it becomes hex, hex, hex. And we can do it, we can reproduce all this with DFT, and in every case, experiment and theory uh, agree about what should be the favored phase. And we can also look at these structures. Um, we can look at the charge densities. These are maps of how the charge density is redistributed upon introducing the guest into the cavities for one of the molecules, which is PE4A. And each of these, so a red blob means that uh, there's an accumulation of electron density. A blue blob means there's a depletion. And every one of these lines of alternating red and blue represents a hydrogen bond. So you can see clearly that there are hydrogen bonds formed between the host and the guest. And depending on which guest I've introduced, I either have four bonds, six bonds, 12 bonds, et cetera. And I can easily calculate also the energies of those bonds. I get a nice linear. Uh, graph, and I can calculate the energies of those bonds. So I have 0 0.082 ele electron volts per bond. So that is all fairly standard stuff. So now comes the part that we're doing, which is a little bit different. So now we want to find a descriptor that will tell us whether I will have the hex or whether I will have the lin. And the three hosts, so this is the descriptor just for the guest, uh, for the host molecules. And they differed, I told you, in the number of COH groups they had, the number of alkoxy side chains they had, and in the length of the molecule. So we look for a descriptor which has this form. It's a slightly non-intuitive form, and I give full credit to my student Sukanya for coming up with this form. So it has a form number of COH groups times the length of the molecule, and then divided by one plus the number of alkoxy side chains. And there's a power alpha here and a power beta here, which is unknown and which remain to be determined. And now, to get the alpha and the beta, you do a regression. 
And what's plotted here is the difference from DFT between the hex and the lin versus the value of this host descriptor. And now the power alpha is turned out to be one, and the power uh, beta is found to be 1 8th, 0.125. And when you do this, you get a nice linear regression. Okay, so far maybe it doesn't seem, it's like what's the big deal? But then is this useful? So what, what does it say? It says that if this quantity is positive, you are in a lin structure. If it is negative, you're in a hex structure. If you're close to the boundary, then you're likely to have a glassy structure. If you're well inside one of these, you're likely to be in the lin or the hex. So let's see if we can predict anything. So now we look at other molecules which were not part of our initial database. So we take four test molecules, and they also have features that are different from our original ones. For example, this one has no uh, head groups at all. Uh, these two have no side chains at all, and we just apply this formula blindly, and it takes, you know, uh, a few seconds to calculate, to evaluate this expression for each of these molecules, and we do that, and we end up with these four stars. And now, based on where these stars are positioned, we can predict that this one will be a glass, this one will be a hex, these two will be lin, etc. And then you do the experiments, and you find, okay, so we could only find experimental data for three of them, but they are indeed correct. This one, it's a prediction which remains to be verified. Okay, but we can do even better than that. We can go and do DFT on these structures, and we can actually get the energy difference between the hex and the lin on these structures. And then we find so these yellow squares are the results from DFT between, for the energy difference between the hex and the lin for these. For this one, because it doesn't have any head groups, it can't form the hex at all, so we can't get an uh, energy difference between them. It can only form the lin. And you see that the stars, which are predicted from the descriptor, and the yellow squares from DFT fall almost exactly on each other, so this descriptor works. So now what about the guests? So for the guests, we have a geometrical descriptor. You look at the guests, you consider the polygons formed by the hydrogen atoms on the periphery of each guest molecule. Now you draw this polygon. Then you draw a circle through this, and you look at the number of vertices, the maximum number of vertices that lie on this circle, and that number is just the guest descriptor. So in this case, it is four, six, eight, 10, 12, and that number alone is the guest descriptor. And now you can plot these same energy differences versus the guest descriptor, and you can, the black uh, lines are for the hex, and the energy, free energy for the hex, and for the lin, and now again you can see if the hex is favored, the black line is below, if the lin is favored, the blue line is below, and if glass is uh, favored, then these two lines lie very close to each other. The only thing is you have these some sudden jumps. That is because in certain structures, because of steric hindrance, you have a jump because you have a phase segregated form. Now you do what is standard uh, when you work with descriptors. You plot uh, a phase diagram in descriptor phase space. So you have a host descriptor and you have a guest descriptor and um, you have a phase diagram which tells you that if you are in this blue area you have a linear structure and if you're in the gray area you have a hex structure and the colors are for, I mean the circles are the 18 uh, host guest combinations we've uh, considered and the colors represent the results from DFT for the difference between the hex and the lin. And you see you have a nice uh, uh, color progression from here where the lin is strongly favored to here where the hex is strongly favored. 
And this is very standard when you're consider ca computing descriptors. You have a clustering of properties in descriptor space. And when you have that, you know that you found the right descriptors. And so now, if you have any other combination of uh, host and guest molecules, you just have to compute the host descriptor and the guest descriptor and see where it falls on this phase diagram, and then you know what is the structure that you will have. That's all very well, but it's a little uh, dissatisfying because you may think it's all just numerology. What does it mean? I went to a talk last week by a famous mathematician, and he defined mathematics as the art of finding patterns and then explaining why those patterns exist. So I have found the pattern, but I haven't told you why it exists. Can I say anything at all about why the pattern exists? And unfortunately, the answer is mostly no. Um, so this is very typical of the descriptors that are emerging, especially those that are emerging from machine learning. So this is going back to the first problem I told you about, about whether if you have octet compounds, you have the rock salt structure favored, the wurzite structure favored, the zinc blend structure favored. This is a paper by Luca Giringelli and Matthias Scheffler where they looked at uh, many, many octet compounds, and then they applied machine learning to find the descriptors. Uh, the colors tell you the difference between, uh, in energies between competing phases. And you see, you do have a separation in descriptors phase, but the descriptors that are coming are really weird, okay? This is the radius of the s orbital of the a element minus the p orbital of the b element times exponential of the s orbital of the a element. Here, this is ionization potential of b minus electron affinity of b divided by the p orbital radius of a squared. So these are really bizarre uh, descriptors that are coming out which you can't easily give physical or chemical uh, interpretations to. So uh, I do want to jump way back in history to tell you, I mean, I'm sure you all recognize what this is. This is uh, Mendeleev's periodic table in 1871 which uh, we may not think of it that way, but it was what he basically did was he, he found descriptors. The rows and columns in his periodic table were basically descriptors, and he found patterns, and he didn't have explanations for them because it was only in 1904 that the electron was discovered, then there's the Rutherford model and the Bohr model, okay? And only then did his descriptors make sense. So I'm not claiming that I found something like the Mendeleev per periodic table, but it is possible that at some point we will understand what are these weird descriptors we're finding out, why do I get this one-eighth power and things like that. Uh, I do have some understanding for the guest descriptor. In the hex phase, the guest descriptor is the number of uh, hydrogen bonds that are formed between the host and the guest, but in the LIN, it is really weird looking, and even there, it's not very clear that it is the number of hydrogen bonds, and they're certainly not identical bonds, whereas here, they're clearly nice six hydrogen, identical hydrogen bonds. So, um, I'm done, so I just wanna tell you that for the first time, we've succeeded in identifying descriptors for self-assembly of molecules on surfaces. These descriptors can be computed at zero computational cost, uh, depending only on the geometry and form of the isolated host and guest molecules in gas phase. I do want to say, of course, uh, what we computed is probably for a limited class of molecules and would have to be generalized for other kinds of molecules. Thank you.